This is The Interested Interview. I'm your host, JJ Clark. And today I'm discussing digital minimalism. And to help me with that task is Peter Cosgrove, future of work expert and author of Family Fun Unplugged. Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. So Peter, as a starting point to this, what is digital minimalism and where did this term originate? Well, um, the first time I heard it was from a author called Cal Newport, who's also um, a professor in university, and he basically described it in three ways. He started by highlighting how this, this technology has really taken over our lives, and he said digital minimalism is an idea that three things. Firstly, technology should be used intentionally, so it should not just be habitual. Secondly, it's for making stuff, not for making us feel better. And thirdly, it shouldn't come before people. And what he realized was that technology had entered all these areas of our life. And while there's lots of positive things, like as somebody once said, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. Unfortunately, when you invent the iPhone and the coolest and most amazing things we can do, we also invent lots of downsides with the technology as well. The thing there is that we invent these technologies to make life easier. But in fact, they don't, they're now making life more difficult. They're making concentration on work more difficult and productivity becomes more difficult because we're looking at our phones all the time. Yeah, so, um, and one of the biggest problems with this is actually most people would disagree with this. They, they, they kind of agree with it, but then when you actually tell them to do something about it, like, well, why wouldn't you take um, Facebook off your phone? Or, you know, why wouldn't you not have the phone in the bedroom? Or when you start giving them actual things they could do to be on their phone less, they're suddenly going, well, well, I'm actually, you know, I'm not on it that much anyway. So I think people like to believe it in theory, but actually I think we're sleepwalking into this whole generation of people staring at the phone being completely addicted. And it's really affecting kind of society and work. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of worrying out loud about technology, you seem to be a person who's who's into your technology, but how long have you been concerned about, I suppose the amount of time we're spending on technology and how it, I suppose, it's inhibiting, you know, productive work. Yeah, I, I suppose like most people, you, you realize over the years that, so years ago, I took things like the email notification off my screen, you know, so you'd be working away and then an email would pop up in the bottom right. And whether you knew it or not, you looked at it for a millisecond and I found out that obviously that apparently, those micro distractions can give you a huge challenge when it comes to focus and work. So you're trying to do something like write an article, but your eyes keep fl- floating to the bottom right to look at the new message. And even though most people don't think they look at it, we do look at it and it interrupts our concentration. So it happened way before the iPhone. Technology started to kind of push things at us the whole time. And it's this whole kind of push economy where, where unless we turn things off, we get interrupted constantly. So that's when I was started getting interested in realizing that I was actually finding it much harder to concentrate and much harder to do what um, Cal Newport's now called deep work, where people are actually focusing one task really well. And all those things just went to a kind of a hundredfold increase when we got the phone in our pocket because we're literally walking around the whole time with a slot machine. And then even if you take the phone away and then you go into work, you've then got your laptop, you've got Netflix, you've got YouTube. So it's very, very difficult to get away from it. And all the business, all the businesses who own these products are spending as much time as, they, as possible to get us back on these screens. Can we focus now on just, I suppose, those strategies to keep us on our phones? And is it just the social media companies that want eyeballs on phones or is it uh, every website out there or every big organization that they're using phones as a window into people to get data on people? Yeah, no, um, it's not just so. The social media companies kind of got a march on everybody because they all had this key metric, which was time on screen. So their main focus, and Facebook were the experts at this, you know, at one stage they were getting people to be on the phone for an hour a day when you think about it. The, the biggest thing they did was this thing called the, the um, kind of infinite scroll button. So now when you're on Instagram or Twitter, it just never ends. So there was a time when you actually would screen to the bottom of Facebook and there would be nothing more to see. And that now ends. So people continue to look. But if you look at um, the CEO of Netflix and you ask him who his biggest competitor is, he doesn't say Amazon Prime or Disney. He says his biggest competitor is sleep. So that's when you start to realize that their focus is to keep us on. If you go onto YouTube now, unless you turn it off, you know that the moment you watch YouTube, 
it'll give you the next video straight away or there'll be 20 um, items on the right hand side that unfortunately we do find very interesting because they're completely you know targeted to the stuff that gets us excited and gets us interested whether that's you know the next five football shots to the latest celebrity model whatever the thing that excites us is there on the right hand side to look at even television is getting involved because it's trying to actually link televisions with a lot of these things so you can watch television while having a social media play in the corner because they realize very few people are only doing one thing at once. So it's literally every part of technology is happening and that's why it's such a challenge. Yeah, it's, it's scary. And, and just on the neurology of it, I suppose they're using sort of fire, fire alarm red for notification settings because that is proven to, you know, get your attention more. But can you talk a wee bit more about intermittent reward? That's, a, I suppose, the gambler's response, the slot machine, as you said. Yeah, well, they've kind of they realised that um, when gaming started, and gaming is where they get a huge amount of data from people, so they really understood in games what kept people on longer. And they realized that, you know, people needed to win a little bit and lose a little bit, and they could essentially work out how long you needed to go before you got a little reward. So if you were playing a Super Mario game and, you know, you know how many rewards you needed to keep you going. If it was too easy, we, we gave up very quickly. If it was too hard, we gave up. So they've used all this data they have to realize the exact same thing with everything else. So that's why so many more programs, you'll watch movies now for the younger generation. There's actually a lot less movies that are slow moving, that takes a while to get into because they won't, they'll give up on the movie after the first 10 minutes. So it was the classic things James Bond movies did 30, 40 years ago where they started with the opening scene because that's what people remembered and it was a really exciting start. And more movies are realizing that unless we grab people's attention straight away. So there's companies obviously like Dopamine Labs, which are actually a company that literally are working on how they actually hit and get our dopamine levels and our serotonin levels up through using technology. And it's, it's scary to think that it's not just technologists anymore. It's behavioral experts, it's neuroscientists who are all working together to find out what is the way they can affect our brain chemistry to keep us excited and on our phones longer without us even knowing about it. Yeah, and, and I suppose um, just on the dig, digital minimalism aspect of it, with Steve Jobs, when he started off, it was the, the iP- iPhone was just a place where you could have music and an ability to call someone in the same place, but it wasn't about checking it all the time. When did phones become this kind of constant companion and that, uh, you know, if you didn't bring it out with your, or say if you got into your car in the morning and then you get you get to your front gate and you're like, oh my God, I left my phone. Like, when did that happen? I suppose it happened because uh, it, so many things are converging. It wasn't just the iPhone. When the iPhone started, it was amazing technology. But what we didn't have was great um, kind of 4G technology, whereas you could stream video. So even when the iPhone started, you couldn't really watch a video very cleverly on your phone because it would take too long to download. And now it downloads really, really quickly, and people can stream YouTube all day on their phone, and it's even cheap. So it's cheaper, it's faster. So once all those things happened, then people started saying, well, now I will use it for maps, and I'll get from one location to another. Now I'll use it for my steps and my health and my heart rate. So what has happened is, bit by bit, we've realized that every part of our daily life, from you know how many steps do we get, where we get our news, how we get our relationships, how we communicate with people, are all done on the same device. So it's become the situation that someone goes, I could never leave my phone at home because I would miss something or I wouldn't be able to do something. So even though only 15 years ago we were very comfortable to go a week without any phone in our hands, we now think it's impossible. And that's how quick it's gone from this idea that it was something that was nice to have, the Steve Jobs' idea, that now it's completely addictive and people could never give up. In your instance where you're very aware of these things, I, I think a lot of people kind of, as as you said, like sleepwalk like around with their phone and are not intentional about their use. What ways do you kind of, I suppose, navigate that and try to set up your work life in that you're not distracted when you're trying to write an article or when you're when you're writing something new or you're doing some productive work what are some ways that you're intentional well when i talk to people about this i say the number one first step is admitting you have a problem and we all do i do we all do because it's not possible we're fighting as i said for however difficult or however hard you're trying to resist your phone there's ten thousand software engineers and other people in silicon valley trying to get you back in your phone so it's not a fair fight so the first thing to say is that you are addicted and if you don't believe you are you won't make these changes so simple things I do is uh, I would never have um, things like WhatsApp on my home screen. I would have it on page four so I don't immediately see it. 
so I don't think of clicking into it. I would never have any notifications on, so I might look at my WhatsApp, but it wouldn't show me that I have any messages. I have to deliberately go into my email, to my phone, to any app to see if I have anything. So I'm in control as opposed to it controlling me. I took all my social media apps. I'm not a huge user, but I am a, a Twitter I would use a lot. I took them off my phone. I used them on my PC and my laptop but I find it difficult to use my phone. My son's got my password, so I can't log in. And that's just to, to realize that I'm addicted to it. I took news sites off because I don't need to look at the news every five minutes. Um, I've got, if I triple click on my uh, phone, it goes black and white, and you're less likely to look when you're black and white. So there's all these things you can do. But honestly, the number one thing I did, which I think people find very difficult, is I just don't have my phone in the bedroom. Yeah, it well, seems really simple, but like I, I wake up with an alarm clock, which we used to all do, and uh, reality is if it's in the phone for the very rare nights, it has to be in there, and there might be a very odd night if my daughter's out and I have to connect, contact her late at night, um, I notice that I can't help picking it up and just having a quick look at it. So that would be the number one thing, because I think there's a huge link with sleep here as well. And and Peter, just on on that, um, I suppose, for example, I'll give you a personal example. I I was about to go on a run the other day, and I got a WhatsApp ba- message from a friend, just just in a like something with a question in it, and I sent the message, but I was waiting for a response. And is that I suppose is that my brain waiting for the dopamine hit of WhatsApp that WhatsApp message to come back in, and and I get that dopamine hit. That red yeah, message. yeah, and um, Catherine Price only recently wrote a book about how to break up with your phone, and she talks about um, one of the key things. She has this kind of twenty-eight day plan, and she says it's not breaking up with your phone as in never using it, but understanding how to use it better. And she says part of this starts with exactly that point. We should see how we feel when we are with our phones. So a lot of us send a message. Everybody will realize that moment, especially in a group where you send a message to a group of people that you think is quite funny and then nobody responds. And then after five minutes, you start to get worried. Oh, was was that inappropriate? Should I have sent that? I wonder if people not like it. And you start to realize that you're having all these horrible feelings for no reason at all, just because you're waiting. And then the moment somebody comes back and goes, ha ha, or that was great, you relax. So yeah. even when we're sending things to people, we have this expectancy. But I would say to most people, even that idea is, what people don't do with the phone anymore is call people. So, you know, if somebody wants to get hold of you and they go, oh, well, I'm not, you know, you didn't respond to my text. I say to them, well, just call me. Like my phone's there. It will ring, but I'm not going to check it all the time. So what you do is you change the dynamic where it is, it is kind of controlling you, which is the way I put it, to, you know, so the only things that beep for me are um, text and phone. So if they ring, I pick up, or if my text goes, because I look at text is urgent. Unfortunately, now the problem is more people now look at WhatsApp than text. So I will miss things. But in my WhatsApp, it says, if, if it's urgent, text me, don't WhatsApp me. Because unfortunately, if I go into WhatsApp, then you also see 40 other messages and then you get, get stuck down a rabbit hole as we all have done. Right. It's the, it's the bane of uh, getting good work done is is the group WhatsApp chat that has notifications yeah. on. Um, j- just on, on that, I suppose, can, can we talk a, a wee bit about just... In social interactions, how the phone and technology has taken us away from wholesome, like conversations, for example, I played a board game uh, with a group of friends uh, a week ago and it was the most sustained amount of conversation we'd had and there was no phones involved. Uh, in about a month it was amazing and and uh, i suppose when i go to to bars pre lockdown you just see people on their phones the whole time and you have that kind of trigger response like every 5 minutes oh i feel uncomfortable with my friends at the bar grab the phone yeah well i mean the first thing is they've become what we call anti boredom devices so the moment or someone else called them their weapons of mass distraction so literally uh, the moment you're sitting there with nothing to do. The first thing you do is you grab your phone. And the moment you realize that, you go, my God, it is controlling me. You don't feel that, but that is the case. If you just can't sit there without your phone, because, you know, when it's there in, within your kind of grip, you know there's a problem. So, but the other problem is if everybody else is on your phone and you're trying not to be on your phone, once again, it's really difficult because you're sitting there not on your phone and you will have people going, what, are you better than me? And they're not saying that, but that's how you can feel about it. Mm. So being intentional about it is critical. So the only way it works in those social situations, as you said, is this idea where people used to go into bars and do phone stacking. Everybody would put their phone in the middle of the table. First person to grab it back had to buy in the next round of drinks. And suddenly everybody enjoyed the game and realized they could actually have great fun without their phones. And that's why we're seeing more activities where people, especially during the summer, are out in boats or out in the water or in places where nobody has their phone or they deliberately tell everybody to leave their phone and they realize if it's not there, everybody's fine. 
but it's not possible to have it when people have their phone because there's always going to be somebody who breaks it and the moment they do. And we've got that phase now people call fubbing, PH fubbing, where people are literally snubbing you by, as you chat them, they're also kind of listening to you, but they're scrolling through your phone. And we somehow think this is normal. Whereas it would be really bizarre if you started chatting to me and as you're chatting to me, I pulled out a landline and I started having a conversation. You would think that was really rude, but we somehow have not got used to the idea that kind of chatting to me, but also scrolling through your phone is not normal and it's not courteous, but we've kind of taken it as, well, that's just the new normal. Fubbing, yeah, it's, it's an interesting term. Yeah. Um, a yeah, very new wave sounding. Um, just just on that, uh, I suppose with with the phone and interactions, uh, re- a really interesting study by Stanford recently was on interactions and people smile less at each other when they have their phone on the table or they have it in their hand uh, when it's part of the interaction and it's just a, an interesting phenomenon uh, that comes forward off that but I suppose uh, with the attention economy because the, there's you know behavioural scientists on this now there's neuroscientists as you said and it's kind of like they're trying to get your eyeballs on the screen and so it, in that your attention is fragmented so you're not you're not able like as in I've when you talk to people that are like I was lucky enough that I came like I'm uh, old enough that I came before mobile phones I wasn't born into a mobile phone yeah. generation but you know if you talk to a 15 year old 14 year old today they'll talk to you for about 14 seconds and then they'll uh, their attention will bounce if you ever watch Love Island they change the uh, the angle of the of the um lens every time so they it's a different angle on the same uh, scene just every 14 seconds or even less because they know that novelty you know excites the brain and it's this yeah. we're being kind of you know i suppose groomed to have a really short attention span which is a really it's a dangerous prospect yeah and and this is a challenge so it, they they you know there've been loads of studies that if i'm sitting there chatting to you and my phone is on the table even if it's not on as you said it's still there and it's affecting because it's part of you saying there's something there that's more important than you and I have to keep it out on the table. If it's hidden from sight, it makes a difference. And as you said, it is just giving a look for the teenagers out there. They say it's kind of giving a low level hum of anxiety throughout their whole life because the difference for anyone like me or maybe like you, JJ, who were around before it, one of the biggest differences was, you know, when I went left school, and the day ended, if it was a good day or a bad day, the day ended. Whereas if I go home now, the day is still continuing because everyone's interacting online. So even if I go off my phone, I know a conversation is still happening. And maybe that conversation is happening about me and I'm not part of it. Okay. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns people have. So, so the phone has led to that level of anxiety that we've never had before. You know, and comedians talk about that. You know, I think it was Louis C.K. or one of the comedians said, you know, when I used to tell a kid in school that, you know, I was rude to them or I said they were fat or something and I saw their face crumple and cry, I felt really bad about myself. But actually, when I can do that online and not see their emotions or face, it's a lot easier for me to bully somebody because I actually don't get the feedback that actually I'm hurting somebody. So there's so many things that are happening there that we don't see it. And I really do... I don't, it's not that I worry about the next generation. I worry about the people who are creating these products and not thinking that maybe they need to do something about some of the things that are actually going to affect us in the longer term. Right, right. And uh, I, I suppose uh, you mentioned knocking off the notifications. I have notification, I have no notifications aside from my alarm clock uh, that are enabled on my phone. Uh, with Facebook, I've kind of discontinued. I've, I've unfollowed everyone on my Facebook feed. So when I get to Facebook, all I see is just an empty screen. I'm like, it's like opening a door into like the living room. <laughs> and I suppose you're, yeah. you're just like, okay, no one's here. And you just, you, you leave. And I, I suppose that was, that was kind of, that's one way I get through it. Uh, I try the first hour and the last hour of the day, I try and not use uh, technology. Uh, is there any kind of monk mode or period of like a fa- like digital fast where you don't, you know, use technology at all? Or is, is your is your job so interwoven with technology? No, I mean, and what I would hate people to think from this that, you know, um, like I'm not on my phone because I absolutely am. And I don't think we can ever live again without them because they're incredibly brilliant machines. So I love them for so many reasons. But as I said, it's more about by not having them in your bedroom. It's amazing. If you think about it, if I get up in the morning and I'm a shower or shave or I'm just there in the bedroom, I'm, it's not there. 
Now, if it was there, I would say it would be picked up within 30 seconds. And the same thing lasting at night, I'd go upstairs and I'd read, and it's not there. So kind of like you, the beginning of the day and the end of the day, it's not there. And if it's not there, you don't look at it. Um, you have to have something like that. Um, the other thing I do, which is just simple, is obviously if I'm trying to actually do something or write something, you know, um, there's kind of apps you can get, like the Forest app, you know, and it sounds ridiculous, but, you know, it's, it, it starts to grow a tree on your phone. You set it to 45 minutes. And as you see the tree growing, if you go into your phone, the tree collapses. And these little things you do that just kind of stop when you pick up your phone to look at it, you look at it and you go, oh, I better not do that. So there are things that we can do to stop us looking at our phone again. And they might feel like, well, you're using your phone not to look at your phone. But it's just back to the thing. We're not going to beat this thing, but we've got to find some strategies to work on it. The other one was YouTube. You can go onto YouTube and you can disable the screen on the right, which I did. There's a plug-in, so I don't get anything on the right-hand side saying, after you've watched this, you need to watch this, and which means if I, if I go in and I watch something, when it ends, it just ends, and I don't have 15 things on the right-hand side to watch next. And I think that's a very powerful one because I think we're spending a lot more time on YouTube as well. Technology, it's not good or bad. It's just a tool. I would kind of like ape uh, Cal Newport in that regard. That I'd say I'd say the same thing. Like it's it's helpful, but then we just we just need to be intentional about how we use it. And what are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of technology and just how how society will deal with it in general? I am incredibly excited and optimistic about the future of technology because I think it's ridiculous how quick it's changing and I think that's amazing. I'm unfortunately not very positive about how we're going to interact with it because as I said before, you know, when you when you create the technology, often people don't create the problems around it. So for instance, there's a story of a guy who created who, who bought this drone in Kentucky and he was, you know, flying it around. It was one of these two thousand dollar drones. He drove it into his uh, overhead and then he heard it being shot down. So he ran into his neighbor's garden, but his neighbor's kids were outside. They'd heard horrible stories about these drones. The father came out really worried and shot it down and in Kentucky you're allowed to have a gun. And then the police were called and they said, well, we don't know how to answer this because there's no rules by shooting drones. And the whole thing kind of got escalated. But eventually they calmed down. But the whole point it was, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the people who created the drones, not thinking that these things are going to happen. And here's the problem. Most companies, the biggest companies in the world, are creating things because it's all about shareholder value. And they're not thinking about some of the negative connotations. And they're the things that only work when you look at things at a societal level. And the one thing that we might see around the whole COVID-19, when it comes to things like climate change, and you have to work at these things in a collaborative uh, model. You need to, uh, governments involved, and you need companies to actually be much more responsible. So it will be about us how much more we'll want to work with companies who we feel being, are being responsible about this, because the technology is going to be exponentially better. And your comment about the earphones, I mean, now a lot of people leave the house with earphones. They don't interact with a single person. They often go into work, then they put headphones in. They don't interact with anyone. And that's just not a normal way of living. That is back to the digital minimalism of Cal Newport, where we said you're literally using technology to almost avoid human relationships. Mm. And that's the one thing we really should not be doing. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, Peter, where can people find you? Just uh, on. on the... Oh, I, um, I just uh, do a lot of work in the future of work. Uh, um, I, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, I've written two books all around keeping families off technology called Fun Unplugged and Family Fun Unplugged, which is all about riddles and brain teasers and philosoph philosophical problems that are actually great fun and get people around a dinner table chatting, hopefully with their phones somewhere in a different room. Wonderful. Peter Cosgrove future of work expert and author of Fun Unplugged and Family Fun Unplugged. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you.